Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension here at UW-Madison, formerly the Cooperative Extension folks. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome back to Wednesday Night Lab, Kevin Masaryk. He's at UW-Stevens Point in the Center for Watershed Science and Education in the College of Natural Resources at Point. And he's also a colleague of mine in Extension here with the Division of Extension at UW-Madison. He was born in Milwaukee and went to Thomas More High School there. And then he went to UW-Stevens Point for his undergraduate degree and studied water resources. Then he came to UW-Madison to get his master's in soil science. Tonight he's going to be talking about uh, something very appropriate since this is the year of clean drinking water. Private wells in Wisconsin. There's very few things having lived on a farm stead, I should say, um, for a few years. Uh, it's good to know what's coming up out of the ground and out of your faucet. And I'm looking forward to hearing what Kevin has to say tonight as he talks with us about private wells in Wisconsin. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Massart back to Wednesday Night Live. I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, a lot of the presentation today will focus on uh, my experiences traveling the state talking to well owners about water quality. Um, Extension has this great program where we help communities organize group testing opportunities uh, for those on private wells. Uh, they submit samples to us, uh, we run those samples, I travel back to that community, and I give a presentation very similar to tonight, helping them understand what their test results mean and helping them understand a little bit about water quality where they live. Um, so I've never got the opportunity to do this at kind of a statewide level or provide a statewide perspective on this, this issue. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for me to do that, especially given that it's the year of, of clean drinking water. If I uh, highlight what I'm going to cover briefly, uh, the things I want to cover is helping people understand if you have a well, uh, or maybe you don't have a well but you rely on a municipal well, uh, where that well water comes from. There's a lot of misunderstandings about groundwater and, and where people's water comes from. I hope to clarify some of those things today. Um, I'll highlight the role of well construction and helping understand where people's water comes from. We'll highlight some common uh, water quality problems, some of which might be important from a health standpoint. A lot of the complaints that I hear from people might actually not be a health concern, but might be related to the taste, the color, or the odor of the water. So we'll talk about some of those issues. Uh, where these problems occur and, and why they occur is something else we'll also uh, try to touch upon. And then uh, scattered throughout the presentation, if, if there are issues, one of the other things we'd like to do is help people understand if there is a problem, that oftentimes there are very simple solutions. So what are those solutions that, that people have at their disposal uh, to improve their water quality? Um, so just getting uh, back to the basics here, uh, where does well water come from? Well water is, is simply groundwater. Uh, when it rains uh, or the snow melts, some of that water is going to soak down into the ground, eventually reaching a point where all the empty spaces in the rock or all the, the, the cracks in the, in the rock or the spaces in between the soil uh, are filled with water. Um, the top of our groundwater is, is basically that water table. Everything below the water table means that all the empty spaces in the soil or rock are filled with water. That groundwater is always moving slowly, oftentimes through the empty spaces in the soil or rock, to a nearby lake, river, stream, or wetland. We use wells as that access point to that groundwater resource. Those wells provide an opportunity for us to, to bring that water, bring that groundwater up out of the ground into our homes. Wells also provide a convenient opportunity for us to understand and measure that water quality. Um, so really it's these wells that are the window into our, our water and people's private wells, because there are so many in Wisconsin, really help us paint the picture of groundwater quality throughout the state. Um, and you'll hear groundwater scientists talk a lot about aquifers um, or we talk a lot about geology. And geology is absolutely critical 
for understanding things like how quickly groundwater moves or how quickly groundwater becomes contaminated. So the different aquifers, uh, we see a nice picture from the Wisconsin Geological Natural History Survey showing that Wisconsin's geology is like a layered cake. Uh, the lowermost layer that we'd find, if we dug a hole deep enough anywhere in the state of Wisconsin, we'd eventually hit a, a bedrock unit which we call crystalline bedrock. Think of your granite countertop at home. If you spill water on that granite countertop, um, it's not really gonna go anywhere. It's not sinking into that material. So we know granite doesn't hold or store a lot of water. That's not a very prolific aquifer in Wisconsin. Wisconsin's groundwater sits in those geologic layers that occur on top of that crystalline bedrock. Um, so it might be in southern Wisconsin here. Uh, it might be alternating layers of sandstones and dolomites. In eastern Wisconsin, it might be coming from what we call the Silurian dolomite aquifer. Um, in most of Wisconsin, with the exception of the southwest region, uh, that groundwater could sit in sand and gravels that were deposited when the glaciers receded. So where you are in the state is really going to determine what aquifers are at your disposal for accessing groundwater or uh, having water for your private well. Um, and if we look at those diagrams of the different rock types, uh, what I'd mention is that water moving through sand or small spaces in between sand grains is gonna move much more slowly than water moving through large cracks or fissures in various rocks. If the water can move through those materials easily, that means contaminants also are typically gonna move through those materials rather rapidly as well, uh, because those cracks or those fissures don't offer a lot of ability for that water to be filtered as it moves through that material. So the geology is really critical for helping us understand things like groundwater susceptibility uh, the different rock materials are also going to impart different uh, chemical characteristics to that water, which we'll talk about or highlight as well. And when we talk about wells, um, you know, typical groundwater access by private wells is, is on the order of probably years or maybe decades old. Uh, most private wells are not accessing water that, uh, that recharged when the glaciers melted. Um, groundwater, the well water that we access is probably a lot younger than people realize. Um, the closer you are to the top of that aquifer or near the water table, typically the younger that water is going to be. As you drill deeper, uh, you're typically going to be accessing water that's older that might be originating from further away from that well location. Um, and I like this diagram because it highlights that anything we do on the land surface <coughs> does have the potential to impact that, that water quality below. So I want to highlight the difference between public and private water supplies. Uh, so Tom highlighted I grew up in Milwaukee. Uh, I grew up on a municipal water supply. Um, those water supplies, I pay a water utility bill that goes to pay a staff that is in charge of, of managing that water system. Uh, those uh, water utilities are required to regularly test that water. And if there's anything wrong with that water supply, if it exceeds some sort of drinking water standard, uh, they're required to bring that water up to, uh, to drinking water standards to, to make sure that it's safe to drink for those people that that water is distributed to. That amounts to about 4.1 million people in Wisconsin. Uh, the other 1.7 million people uh, rely on private wells. Those are rural, rural wells that people out in the country uh, use to bring water into their homes. Uh, there's about 800,000, uh, that's the estimate of how many wells exist in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, things to point out about these wells is they're not required to be regularly tested. There are some testing requirements at the time the well is drilled. Uh, they are required to be tested for bacteria. And as of 2014, they're also required to be tested for nitrate. Anytime there's well or pump work done um, or a well inspection, uh, those wells are required to be tested for bacteria and as of 2014, nitrate and arsenic. Um, so those are the only times where private wells are required to be tested. And those are the only parameters that they're required to be tested for. There's a whole host of other problems that, that we might experience in our wells uh, that unless you're taking it upon yourself to do those tests, we might not have a great understanding of. 
Um, and if people do find something wrong with their well water, I think a lot of times the people I talk to are surprised that they're not required to take any sort of corrective action. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I hear people say they don't want to test their water, because if they find something wrong, they're scared that they're going to have to do something to fix it. Um, and if we find something wrong with, with well water through these testing programs, um, our information is purely educational. We want to give people the tools uh, to take those corrective measures that will help give them safe water. But they're not required to do that. So the message I often give people is that if you have a private well, uh, you really are your own water utility manager. Um, it's up to you to decide what, how often you're going to test, and if there is anything wrong, what those next steps might be. Um, and when we look at a private well, um, you know, typically all we might realize about our private wells, all might, we might think about is that top 12 to 14, 14 inches that sticks out of the ground. That's what most people probably think of when they think of their well. It's important to realize, though, that there's a lot happening below that ground surface that we, we can't see. Um, we might like to, but it would be very difficult to understand things like, you know, what is that rock or what is that material that that well is drilled into? Um, without some sort of camera or visual inspection of that area below our feet, a lot of times we're, we're using our, our, our best guess. Um, and those best guesses a lot of times are based on reports that are filed when that well is constructed uh, by the well driller themselves. Um, every well that's drilled in the state of Wisconsin is required to have a, a well construction report filled out at the time of drilling. Um, as of 1988, all new wells also have a unique, Wisconsin unique well number. That's a unique code that is specific to an individual well, and that creates great opportunities for us to, to do kind of data mining exercises that help us learn and understand Wisconsin's groundwater. So for the people in this room, if you're curious about things like, you know, how deep is my well? Uh, how deep did they have to drill before they hit the water table? That metal pipe that sticks out of the ground, how far does it extend below our feet? Those are all really critical pieces of information to know that will help us better understand that, that private water supply. So if you're on a private well, um, that information is often readily accessible. Um, and I've, I've created or, or put the link on here uh, with some information about where people can go if they're looking to obtain, obtain some information about their private well at home. Um, so just know that there's a lot happening below the ground. Um, again, there's the, 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 the casing, uh, there's submersible pumps, there might be well screens, and then there's connections that connect up to that well to bring the water into our homes and into our pressure tanks. So transitioning into to kind of the quality or the, 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 the private well water quality concerns, uh, most people in this room are, are familiar with the term universal solvent. Uh, water is a polar molecule, which means it's very good at dissolving things. So as much as we all want pure drinking water or pure water, we have to realize that in the natural environment, we never find pure H2O. Uh, that groundwater is always going to have impurities depending on the types of rocks or minerals that that groundwater is moving through. It depends on the types of land use where that water infiltrates uh, and soaks down into the ground. It might even depend on the types of plumbing or packaging that that water is stored or transported in. So Flint, Michigan really highlighted uh, how plumbing, how the water system itself can impact uh, various water supplies. Uh, where the source of that lead was not the groundwater, it wasn't the, uh, the lake or river where that water was coming from. Uh, the source of that lead was the plumbing system. When they changed water supplies, uh, a water supply that was more corrosive or aggressive, uh, it started to peel away or expose a lot of that lead that ended up in people's homes. Um, if there are impurities that eventually reach a, a point where they're concerned for health, uh, a lot of times we want to do something about it. And, and I think it's important to, to point out that if we do find contaminants in our water, um, there are a lot of variety of ways, uh, treatment being one of them, that we can make that water a little bit safer to drink. So when we talk about health concerns associated with water, I do think it's important to point out that there's two different categories of, of health concerns associated with, with water. 
Some of these are acute effects, and acute effects are those that are seen within a short time of exposure to a particular contaminant or substance. So examples here would be pathogenic organisms, uh, things like E. coli, uh, which are associated with foodborne illnesses. We can also see those types of organisms in, in, in well water. And those are examples where shortly after being exposed to those organisms, people are gonna develop some sort of health complication, usually some sort of gastrointestinal illness, uh, some of which can be quite serious, especially for immunocompromised individuals. There's this other category of health effects which we'd call chronic health effects, which result from exposure to these, these substances over a long or extended period of time. Um, so things like arsenic or pesticides that we might find in well water, um, these are things we know that increase the risk of developing things like cancer. If these things are in somebody's water, drinking the water once or twice isn't likely to develop um, or, or result in, in those sort of health consequences. But if we find those things in water, especially if they're above certain levels, uh, and people are using this water supply for years or decades while they're in the home, then those people are at an increased risk for health complications later in life. Is it a guarantee that people are gonna suffer from those health consequences? Certainly not. Uh, but it does mean or is associated with an increased risk. Uh, so if we put that into perspective, um, I've listed a variety of different environmental kind of factors related to various chronic health concerns. Um, I'd point out that you know, there's a, a whole host of, of risk factors for various, various types of cancers. Uh, drinking water, environmental factors being one, but there's other things like the use of tobacco products, our diet, that also have large impacts on whether or not somebody's likely to, to, to suffer from these illnesses. Uh, but if we put these things into context, um, we look at something like indoor radon combined with smoking. Uh, if there's a thousand people that fit that category or that population, we would expect 32 out of 1,000 people uh, to develop lung cancer from those environmental factors or conditions. Um, if we look at water specifically, arsenic is a, a contaminant with a health standard associated with it. It used to be uh, 0.050 milligrams per liter or 50 parts per billion. 1,000 people, if they were using a water supply with that level for years or decades, we would anticipate that 13 of those 1,000 would likely develop cancer from that water. So it's not a guarantee, but it does come with an increased risk. Um, and we can take simple steps a lot of times to reduce those risks. Um, if 13 out of 1,000 is not acceptable, there are simple things that people can do to reduce those risks even further. When we talk about different categories of well water constituents, um, there's a variety. There's, there's literally hundreds of different tests that people could do on their water supply. Um, I try to limit the amount of tests that people do to those that we know are gonna be important, either from a health standpoint, so there's a category that says important to health. Um, those tests that are important because it contributes to taste, color, or odor problems that people often complain about regarding their water. And then there's other tests that we might do because they're indicators of overall water quality. They might help us understand things like how corrosive or aggressive is that water going to be. There's other useful information that we can learn uh, that might not be directly related to health or aesthetic issues associated with well water. So in transitioning to some of the common issues or, or problems that people have, uh, I'm gonna start with coliform bacteria. This is probably the most important test for people on private wells to do on a routine or regular basis. The well code which the DNR administers is based on this idea that a properly constructed well should be able to provide bacteria-free water continuously without treatment. Um, that is the one thing that DNR regulates is well construction. Um, so they're trying to get people the, the best possible chance at getting a bacteriologically free or a sanitary water supply. Um, coliform bacteria is an indicator test. Um, it's an indicator of the sanitary condition of that well. Coliform bacteria on their own generally don't cause illness, but the concern is that if coliform bacteria are getting into that well, it indicates a potential pathway for other harmful organisms to enter that water supply also. 
Um, sources of coliform bacteria um, are, are soils. They can live on so in soils or on vegetation, uh, but we can also expect to find them in human or animal waste. So that's why we feel it's a, a good indicator of the sanitary integrity of that water system. If coliform bacteria is detected, if you submit a sample to a lab for bacteria, they're gonna first check for coliform bacteria. If it's positive for coliform bacteria, they will then check that sample to see if it's also positive for E. coli. Uh, so E. coli, if a well ever comes back positive for E. coli, uh, that's confirmation the source of that bacteria is some sort of human or animal waste source. And obviously that's a much more serious situation because if human or animal waste is getting into that well, there's a whole host of other pathogens besides E. coli that we might be concerned about. Uh, things like Salmonella, Campylobacter, Cryptosporidia or Giardia uh, would mean if E. coli was present, it would mean that those other pathogens are much uh, more likely to be found in that water supply. And those are things, coliform bacteria again, on its own doesn't necessarily mean that people are gonna get sick from that water. But having evidence of these other pathogens uh, would give us some indication that that water supply is probably unsuitable as a drinking water source. Uh, we would be concerned about people being able to fend off those bacteria if this was their primary water supply. So as a, as a, a, you know, as a, a rule of thumb, if, if a well ever comes back positive for E. coli, uh, we generally encourage, strongly encourage those people to stop using the water for drinking and cooking until the problem can be corrected and a safe bacteria test is obtained. So the question I often get uh, when a, somebody gets a positive bacteria sample is where is that bacteria coming from? Um, and these are pictures that I've collected over the years from some colleagues. Uh, this is the only interactive part of the presentation here. Um, these are all bacteriologically positive wells with the exception of one. Does anybody wanna guess what the good well, which the good well is? I see and I've heard some people pointing to the left and, and this is not a trick question. Um, there's obvious defects with a lot of those pictures. Um, in the case of the one on the, the far right, the casing is cracked. Anytime it rains, um, water is falling directly into that well. There's insects that might be able to crawl into that well. Um, that bottom picture actually shows, it's a little bit difficult to see, but if you look, there's actually earwigs crawling around the inside of that casing. Um, if, they, if they fall, if they drop into that well, uh, those insects can carry and harbor bacteria in their intestinal tract uh, that would cause or result in, in positive bacteria samples. Um, there's a picture in the middle where the dog is, is kind of chained within a, a close proximity to that well. If it's hanging out there all day, it's probably doing other things there uh, that we, we, we shudder to think uh, about if that's where we're getting our drinking water from. Um, the types of connections we have. There's a, a, a yard hydrant in that one picture that's affixed to the top of that well. We also see that there's a hose affixed to it. Um, if that hose doesn't have proper backflow prevention, anytime you shut that yard hydrant off, all the water in that hose potentially will be siphoned back into that well. And we know hoses are kind of breeding grounds for, for bacteria. Um, we need to make sure that we have proper backflow prevention to ensure that we're not contaminating um, our drinking water source. Um, there's that other picture which is showing kind of large or tall grass, um, and there's some white specks on that grass. That's an area next to the well. Uh, this is a person that had a positive E. coli sample, but also had a bird feeder directly above <laughs> their wellhead. Um, so these are not pictures that I use to make fun of people. They're pictures that I use to highlight that we don't always think about where our water comes from. And there are very simple things that every well owner can do to make sure that they get the best possible opportunity at getting a sanitary water supply. So as unsightly as that metal pipe looks sticking out of the ground, um, we generally encourage people to leave that area free and clear. Anything that conceals that well is also gonna provide concealment for things like small animals or insects. Uh, Keeping that free and clear also means that if a well driller or pump installer has to come and service that well, that they're not having to move a lot of material, they're not having to, to 
to disrupt flowers or shrubs that may have been planted to conceal that well. Um, the grass around that well is probably a little bit green for my liking. Uh, I probably, you know, more fertilizer applied on that lawn than I would recommend. Um, but keeping that area pretty well manicured is probably the best thing that you could do uh, to ensure that you're giving it the best chance at getting, getting sanitary water. Other things to look for on your property, um, there's a picture of an old dug well. That old dug well, the, the diagram below it kind of shows if, if we keep those holes open, those holes represent kind of direct <coughs> conduits into the aquifer. So if it floods or if it rains, that water has a direct conduit down into the aquifer where your new well might be pulling its water from. So if we don't properly fill and seal those old holes, uh, we might be continuing to contaminate the aquifer that you or your neighbor might be getting their water from. Um, and then I have a picture on the right showing a livestock water. Um, that's another opportunity for, without proper backflow prevention, it's another opportunity for those systems to contaminate, uh, contaminate wells. So those are things that are related to well construction. Um, other reasons why wells might be susceptible to bacterial contamination might be the soils or the geology. And I really like this diagram because it shows in areas with very thin soils, uh, those areas might also be more prone to having things like sinkholes. Uh, that water, that surface water, uh, is getting into the aquifer rather quickly without adequate filtration. So in this diagram, we see uh, that empty space, or we see the, the, the well, um, basically we have the well depth, um, and then we have the casing, so those black lines represent the depth of the casing, which in this diagram just extend to the top of that aquifer, which means that that whole bottom section of the well is open to the aquifer, and the picture highlights really nicely that water from that sinkhole basically has a direct pathway into that well. If we extend that casing deeper into the aquifer, that means that we've sealed off that upper part of the aquifer, and now that water is being pulled from much deeper. Um, it doesn't mean that that water can't be contaminated, but we've sealed off some of those direct pathways, which means that what happens at the surface, it's gonna be much more difficult from that water, for that water from that surface to get down deep into the aquifer where that well is now pulling its water from. So this diagram, I think, is important to highlight that while well depth is important, a lot of people talk about how deep their well is, that's only one component. Well casing is equally as important for determining where within an aquifer somebody is getting their, their private well water from. If we look at bacteria occurrence in Wisconsin wells, what we see, if we tested all roughly 800,000 private wells in the state of Wisconsin, we'd estimate that at any given time, about 15 to 20% would come back positive. Some of that's due to well construction, some of it might be due to geology. Um, less than 2% of those samples are coming back positive for E. coli. Um, so having coliform bacteria doesn't necessarily indicate human or animal waste. Uh, however, this would say or, or, or show you know, that right around 2% likely do show some evidence that, that human or animal waste are impacting people's wells. What we might also notice about the map is that the darker areas are, are higher uh, likelihoods of having bacteria. The lighter areas are lower risk. Areas where we have you know, very sandy soils like central Wisconsin typically have a lower risk of bacteria in their wells. Sand is typically a great filter, which I think means that there's maybe less potential for bacteria to get down into the aquifer where people in the central part of the state are pulling their water from. Anywhere where the, the positives or the percent exceedance is greater than about 20%, to me that speaks to some sort of geologic concern, which makes those areas more prone uh, to having bacteria in their wells. Um, and if we look at you know, one of those main geologic considerations, it would be areas where we have fractured bedrock, you know, shallow soils overlying that, that carbonate, cracked, fractured bedrock are areas that we would suspect have a greater potential for this geologic susceptibility or this consideration for, you know, bacteria to get into the aquifer without adequate filtration. 
So if people have positive coliforms, what's the procedure? First, we'd recommend people retest. Uh, and if two tests in a row are positive, then the next step is to identify where that, uh, that, that positive sample might have resulted from, correct any sort of sanitary defect, disinfect the well, and then retest to ensure that that water supply is bacteria free. Uh, for those people that have reoccurring bacteria problems, uh, the best long-term solution might be looking at, can that well be constructed in a better way uh, that would give it a greater likelihood of providing sanitary water? It would be great if wells lasted forever, but the older the well is, uh, chances are it wasn't constructed with the same types of materials that we use today. Uh, so as a well ages, uh, typically we might expect more potential uh, for well construction to impact that result as well. So transitioning into some of the other common complaints that we get um, are going to be things that are impacted by the rocks or the soils uh, that, that that water is stored or transported in. Um, so hard water is one of the common complaints that people have, and, and water hardness results from calcium and magnesium in the different rocks that that, that groundwater is stored in. Um, so limestone, or in the case of Wisconsin, dolomite rocks contain calcium and magnesium. Water flowing, flowing through those rocks is going to dissolve small amounts of calcium and magnesium. Um, we consider water to be hard when it's greater than about 200 milligrams per liter of hardness. And then anything less than 150 is considered to be soft water. So while hard water, some of the issues people are going to have are, are going to be scale depositing on fixtures, maybe in the pipes, on the water heaters. People with hard water tend to go through a lot more detergent or soap because uh, hard water makes it more difficult for that water to form a lather. Uh, those are the typical problems people have uh, that they associate with hard water. When we look at water hardness in Wisconsin, we know that Wisconsin has, in general, very hard water. If you're in eastern Wisconsin, chances are you have uh, very hard water. Southern Wisconsin, the same thing. As we get into northern Wisconsin, the water, the, the types of rocks or minerals that that water is stored in uh, don't contain as much of those elements. So as we progress into northern Wisconsin, we know that the water tends to be lower in hardness, and in some cases even what we would consider to be soft water. Um, and it really follows the geology. Those areas where we have carbonate rocks, eastern Wisconsin, uh, southern Wisconsin, and parts of, of western Wisconsin, um, correlate really well with those areas where people with wells uh, are dealing with hard water. If you have hard water, uh, fortunately there's a relatively tried and true technology that helps deal with, with water hardness, and that's going to be a water softener. Uh, so there's a, the, the, there's a lot of people in Wisconsin that, that have water softeners on their wells. Um, and these are you know, fairly uh, easy to use technologies that remove calcium and magnesium, but what some people might not realize is that in the process of removing those elements, uh, it has to replace it with something else. Um, and that something else is typically going to be sodium, because we use sodium chloride to regenerate the, the resin bed of water softeners. Uh, so with this method, it's an exchange method. It's removing the unwanted calcium and magnesium, but it's adding back in a little bit of sodium. Uh, that sodium, for most people, is not going to be a, a major concern. But if, if somebody tells them, or if somebody's doctor tells them that I want you to limit your sodium intake, that additional sodium that's coming from that water softener could be a health consider consideration that people want to uh, want to think about. So with water softening, um, most people will actually bypass their primary drinking water faucet for that reason, that they don't want the additional sodium, but also because a lot of people think that water with calcium and magnesium tastes a little bit better. Um, if you ever have drink in reverse osmosis water, a lot of bottled water might be reverse osmosis water, uh, some people complain about the taste. They, they think it tastes flat or it doesn't taste like anything. Uh, and that's because we've removed some of those elements like calcium and magnesium. Um, so for that reason, sometimes people will bypass their primary drinking water faucet. And there's really no reason to soften the water that you're using to, to water the lawn uh, or water your garden. 
Um, so bypassing the outdoor faucet could also save you a lot of money in terms of softener salt. Transitioning into something else that uh, rock or soil impacts, uh, arsenic is another element of concern in Wisconsin. This is naturally occurring, coming from the soils or other geologic materials. Uh, we know that areas on the western side of Lake Winnebago uh, can have some of the highest arsenic concentrations anywhere in the world. And it's due to a specific geologic formation. Uh, and that geologic formation has resulted in special casing areas in that part of the state. Those special casing areas are designed to help people avoid uh, having their well um, in contact with that really arsenic rich layer. Um, so by adjusting the casing or adjusting the depth of the well, uh, people are able to easily avoid uh, that layer with, with, with the high arsenic. The health standard for arsenic, if we look, 0 0.010 milligrams per liter or 10 parts per billion. Um, is associated with, with various types of cancers. So there is incentive for us to reduce exposure to arsenic in our drinking water. And fortunately, there's a couple different treatment options out there for people um, if they do have elevated levels of arsenic in their water. Um, this map, it's important to point out that those, those areas that are blank are just areas where we don't have sufficient data to be able to say with a lot of confidence what typical levels would be. Um, so because arsenic is is more recent in terms of our recommendations for testing. We just haven't amassed the same amount of data for some of these constituents. Uh, but hopefully through time, we'll be able to fill in this picture and give people a better indication of the likelihood of encountering arsenic where they live. Iron is another uh, common complaint. It might be the most common complaint I hear people talk about in regards to their well water. Um, it's naturally occurring coming from the soils and the rock. Um, areas where the groundwater is low in oxygen, uh, areas near wetlands or maybe lakes, um, areas where the soil has a lot of carbon or organic matter tend to have really low oxygen levels. And water that's low in oxygen has a greater ability to dissolve iron that might occur in the soils or the bedrock. Um, so that's why it's, it's probably more common for people that live near lakes or in low-lying areas to be experiencing issues with high iron. Um, while there's no health concerns associated with iron, uh, it does cause some aesthetic issues. Uh, that red or that orange staining might look pretty familiar for people. If you have a well at home or you have lake property, that's going to be a common sight. Um, elevated levels of iron also are going to give water kind of that irony or characteristic well water taste. When I hear people talk about not liking the taste of well water, a lot of times I think, I think they're talking about uh, so levels of iron in the water that are giving it kind of a metallic, metallic taste. Um, iron, elevated levels of iron also increase the potential for what we call iron bacteria. Um, that's a bacteria that if you spend a lot of times in the, time in the woods, um, near lakes or wetlands, you might see kind of an oily sheen on the top of water. And I think a lot of people assume that that's gasoline or oil that might have run off the, a parking lot. Um, but a lot of times that might be naturally occurring iron bacteria. Um, and that same bacteria can occur in people's private wells. Uh, it gives water kind of an off-putting taste or an off-putting smell. And it might tend to clog people's, uh, people's plumbing system a little bit. Um, so if people do have high iron, um, there are treatment options available uh, that would help alleviate some of those concerns, water softeners being one of them. Although if your levels of iron are extremely high, greater than three milligrams per liter, um, a water softener is probably not gonna be adequate to reduce all the iron in that well. Um, there might be more appropriate technology available if people have really high concentrations of iron in their water. Uh, manganese is another concern. It's very similar in terms of where and why it occurs uh, to iron. Uh, there's an aesthetic level we're over that standard or over that level, uh, people are likely to notice kind of black or brown specks in their water. Uh, so there's a picture of a toilet tank where there's a fine black sediment in the bottom of that toilet tank, and that's, uh, that's precipitated manganese uh, that's coming out of solution. Um, so black or brown staining uh, might be associated with this, with this element. Um, too much manganese, levels above 0.300 milligrams per liter, um, also is, is a concern for health. 
Uh, Long-term exposure to manganese is associated with uh, various nervous system disorders. Parkinson-like symptoms might result from exposure to elevated manganese um, in people's well water. So just like iron, there are various types of treatment available that would help alleviate these, these issues or concerns. Uh, pH is another uh, constituent. pH uh, is a measure of water acidity. Most of us are probably familiar, have heard of pH. We know that things that are less than seven are acidic, things that are greater than seven are basic. Uh, the map shows the variety of, of pH levels in Wisconsin. Most groundwater pH is gonna be in the range of, of probably five and a half to nine on that pH scale. Um, with harder uh, or, or more basic water occurring in, in eastern and southern Wisconsin. And as we move north, there's a greater potential for that water to be lower in pH. Uh, with areas around Nesita, uh, there's geology there. Because that geology is so void of carbonate minerals, uh, that water there tends to be really low in pH and as a result is, is highly corrosive or aggressive. Um, so those areas, people that have metal plumbing um, are gonna have challenges uh, maintaining kind of metal plumbing systems because that corrosive water may tend to eat away or corrode uh, things like copper, copper plumbing. So when we talk about copper in drinking water, this is also a common concern. Uh, copper is not coming from the groundwater itself. Reasons why elevated levels of copper might occur in drinking water is that plumbing system. So water traveling through those pipes, especially if it's corrosive, uh, has a potential to dissolve unsafe levels of copper. Um, there are health effects associated with that. Um, that's why testing can be useful. But there is also another telltale sign of copper corrosion, and that would be kind of blue-green staining that might occur on people's, uh, people's faucets um, or their, their sinks. If you notice blue-green staining, that's probably an indication that copper dissolution is occurring and precipitating on that fixture. Uh, lead is very similar to copper in that the source of that lead is not the plumbing system, or it's not the groundwater, it's gonna be the plumbing system. Um, prior to 1985, lead solder was used to join together copper plumbing, and various brass uh, fixtures will also still contain uh, concentrations or, or portions of lead. So water coming in contact with those fixtures or that plumbing uh, has the potential to dissolve some of that lead and notice that the health standard for lead is extremely small. Um, there is no known benefits to lead in the human body. So although levels less than 0.015 are, are considered acceptable, uh, we wanna reduce that exposure as much as possible. Ideally, the, the health standard for lead should be, should be none. And if we're looking at solutions to, to lead and copper, if these things are in the plumbing system, Fortunately, with private wells, there's relatively easy ways to minimize our exposure to lead and copper, and that's simply to let the water run for a minute or two before using it for drinking or cooking. A lot of times, the, the problem is gonna be from water sitting or standing in contact with that plumbing system for a long or extended period of time. Um, so by letting that water run, uh, we're really allowing that, that water to flush that lead and copper out of those, out of those lines. And then next, I wanna highlight some of the things that we do on the land surface that could potentially impact the, the groundwater below. Um, and anything we do, whether it's agricultural activity, lawn care, um, septic system drain fields, all those things have the potential to, to pollute or contaminate our water supply. Uh, and oftentimes, it might not be what we're doing on our property. It might be what somebody else is doing up gradient of our well that's responsible for our water quality. Um, so this is my plug that we all try to be good neighbors. Uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We wanna make sure that we're maintaining uh, our, our yard or our groundwater so that we can protect somebody else down, downstream. Um, if we look at influences on a well, uh, what I say is kind of a good rule of thumb if you're trying to understand what the major influences are is uh, pull up a, a Google Maps and, and draw a half mile circle around the well. Uh, chances are pretty good with private wells that what's influencing that well is happening within a half mile or so of the well. Um, if we know the groundwater flow direction, we can narrow that down even further by assuming that water is coming from up gradient of that well. 
And if we know things about how deep that well is or how deep that well is cased, uh, we often can, can make inferences about how far away that water might be originating. Shallower wells, that recharge area for that well is gonna be much closer. Uh, deeper wells, that water is likely coming from further away. And I think those diagrams on the left do a nice job of highlighting uh, what we consider capture zones for various, various uh, well constructions. Um, so with regards to land use impacts, nitrate is one of the common things that we uh, look for. Um, levels less than two we consider to be kind of natural or background levels. Greater than two, there's some human impact uh, that is being had on that water. And then when it's greater than 10, that water is considered unacceptable uh, for drinking, especially for women who are pregnant or trying to become pregnant, or infants less than six months of age. Um, sources of that nitrate include various fertilizers, maybe manure or other biosolids that we're applying to the landscape. Septic system drain fields um, are also going to release some nitrate as well as decomposing organic matter. But in general, natural levels of nitrate in Wisconsin's groundwater, we would expect to be less than two milligrams per liter. Various health impacts associated with nitrate, which is a reason why it's tested for so often. Uh, noticing that infants and, and pregnant women are the, the target population for that standard. Um, although adults, there's possible correlations to, to health impacts in adults as well. Um, the other thing about nitrate is that if nitrate is getting through, uh, also an indicator that other possible contaminants might be getting through as well. So if the nitrate is associated with agricultural chemicals, greater likelihood of finding things like pesticides. If that nitrate is coming from septic system drain fields, greater likelihood of finding things like pharmaceuticals or maybe human viruses in that water supply. When we look at nitrate in Wisconsin's groundwater, um, there's good and bad news. The good news is that about 57% of all private wells that we have data for are less than two milligrams per liter in that natural or background level. Um, we do have about 10% of wells, however, that exceed that 10 milligram per liter standard. There's about 2.2% that exceed 20 milligrams per liter. And if we go above 40, there's even some wells that would exceed four times that, that drinking water standard. So while the majority of wells in, in Wisconsin are, are actually you know, pretty low with respect to nitrate, uh, we do have work to do. Uh, and we do have to put a priority on encouraging people in those areas where we know nitrate exists, put a priority on, on helping them understand how to test their water. Nitrate is often associated with agricultural landscapes. That's the reason northern Wisconsin, uh, there's a lower chance of finding elevated levels of nitrate in northern Wisconsin than in some of the agricultural areas uh, of the state. Geology also contributes to where we find nitrate, knowing that Areas with, with coarse textured sandy soils are gonna be more susceptible to, to that nitrate from the surface getting into the groundwater than areas where we have heavy clay textured soils. And then areas with uh, karst or shallow soils overlying carbonate rocks, such as we might find in the Door County or Kiwani County area, we know that that type of geology is also associated with a greater risk of having nitrate in people's well water. So land use is the, the, the source of that nitrate, but geology and soils can also uh, contribute to areas being more susceptible. For those that have elevated nitrate, you know, ideally we'd like to eliminate that contamination source, but that could take years or decades to notice measurable improvement. That's why in the short term, people are oftentimes looking at, will drilling a new well get me water that's lower in nitrate? Uh, maybe they choose bottled water. Maybe they choose some sort of water treatment. Um, and water treatment, if you're designing it or using it to remove nitrate, uh, you're really talking about treatment methods called reverse osmosis, distillation, or anion exchange. A lot of people will ask me, does my water softener remove nitrate? And the answer is no. Uh, does that pure uh, pitcher filter that I bought at Target or Walmart, does that remove nitrate? And the answer is no. Um, if we're treating for health-related contaminants, it's really important to know what uh, contaminants uh, of concern is, what level we're trying to treat, and then designing or, or purchasing a system that we know will be effective for that particular element. And 
this slide is nice because it, it points out the, uh, it makes the point that treatment does come at a cost. Um, these things aren't free, and oftentimes there's maintenance that, that goes along with it that people have to consider as well. Um, chloride is another thing that is associated with land use impacts. Natural levels of chloride are gonna be typically less than 10 milligrams per liter. Uh, sources are, are oftentimes very similar to nitrate in that we can get elevated chloride from, from agricultural activity or fertilizer use, mainly potash that's applied to fields. Uh, some of that is gonna be potassium chloride. So the plant needs the potassium, but the chloride is very soluble and can leach into water. Septic system drain fields, especially for those households that have water softeners, are gonna be discharging a lot of salt or, or chloride to that drain field, and that can also be a potential source, as can road salt. So on days like today or, or during the winter, when we're de-icing roads, um, we're applying a lot of times sodium chloride. Um, that does a nice job of de-icing or melting the, the snow off the road, uh, but that's gotta go somewhere. Uh, and oftentimes it, it's gonna go into the ditch, and in spring, um, that, that infiltrating water is gonna carry that salt down into the groundwater with it. So some of the highest concentrations that we find for chloride tend to occur near major highways or roadways or just outside kind of urban centers uh, because of all the de-icing activity that we have to do in this state. Um, and while chloride doesn't have a health standard associated with it, uh, levels greater than 250 milligrams per liter may give water kind of a salty taste. And really high levels of chloride might actually corrode some metal plumbing uh, particularly stainless steel is, is pretty susceptible uh, to high levels of salt or, or chloride. Uh, the last thing I want to mention in terms of, of water quality problems is, is pesticides. This is another common question that we get. Uh, pesticides uh, are oftentimes associated with health effects and pesticides could include insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, other substances that we use to control for pests. Um, some of these things are water soluble and, and can infiltrate and soak down into, into groundwater. Uh, the thing about pesticides is that we don't have health standards for all the chemicals or compounds um, that are used in Wisconsin. Um, and oftentimes when we do have the research, uh, they're related to the parent compound or the parent product. We know those products can break down into various metabolites and there's not a lot of research into what health complications might result from the various metabolites that we find in groundwater, let alone research into the combination or the synergistic effects of all those chemicals that might occur in somebody's well water. Um, so while most wells that test for pesticides, uh, most wells don't detect levels above health standards, it's not to say that you know, we wouldn't benefit from reducing the level of pesticides in our groundwater because we know that roughly 42% of all private wells in Wisconsin contain one or more detectable pesticides. Um, so that's you know, a, a fairly large number of wells for which uh, we're, we're having some evidence that pesticides are showing up in people's well water. Uh, and we know from research that the Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection does, uh, we know the most frequently detected pesticides in Wisconsin's groundwater are gonna be allochlor, metolachlor, atrazine, or breakdown components of those, those compounds. Um, so we have some data that if people have a private well and they wanna test for pesticides, we can oftentimes give recommendations on what chemicals they wanna test for, because pesticides are very expensive to test for. We wanna minimize the amount of money that people are spending, so we wanna help them target uh, the most likely compounds that they would expect to find. Uh, unfortunately, again, the research shows that uh, we can help people narrow down what tests they might want to consider. Um, so when we talk about wells, we talked about water treatment. And I'd just like to mention that water treatment is often a great option for people to improve their well water quality. Uh, it reduces levels of contaminants and other impurities. It improves taste, color, and odor. Uh, but there are other things that we have to consider before choosing water treatment. Um, and that's that those devices, once they're purchased, it's great, but unless we're properly maintaining that device, um, it might lose effectiveness over time. Uh, so we have to take into consideration routine maintenance of that device. 
Treatment also might increase energy use. Things like reverse osmosis or distillation can be quite energy intensive. So that water treatment device might actually increase energy costs uh, that you're paying uh, at your home. And then if we're using treatment to treat for a health-related contaminant, sometimes the only way to know if that device is working properly is to test the treated water as well. And that comes at an additional expense. If you're treating for a health-related contaminant, we really want to understand how effective is that device for improving water quality with respect to those contaminants. Um, other things to keep in mind is that treatment methods are selective. Know what you're trying to remove and then purchase the device that, that you know will work for that, that concern. And sometimes multiple treatment units might be necessary. So reverse osmosis is great, but it really operates much more effectively or efficiently if that water that's being sent to that device is treated through a water softener. Um, that water softener reduces the amount of scale formation that might plug up that RO membrane. Um, so some of these devices are gonna benefit from having multiple treatment devices, which would also add to the cost. So you know, getting to the end here, um, I've tried to summarize if you own a private well, uh, again, you are your own private water utility manager. Uh, what are the, the things to keep in mind with that? And I'd say it comes down to periodically inspect and maintain the area around your well. Um, make sure that you know, you're looking for the obvious things that might be contributing to water quality problems. Uh, test your water regularly to evaluate common water quality concerns. And if that testing reveals issues or problems, uh, take, corrective, take corrective actions. Um, and a lot of times people find out that there's nothing wrong with their water, that it's actually quite good. Um, and that might come as a surprise to people, especially with, with how much water quality, well water quality has been in the news. But oftentimes testing alleviates uh, some anxiety that people might have about the quality of their well water. Because a lot of that testing reveals that again, water quality, well water quality in Wisconsin is quite good. So while testing might indicate problems, a lot of times it might not. And in those cases, no corrective action would be, would be necessary. Um, if you're looking to understand, if I have a private well, what should I be testing for? Uh, we would recommend every well be tested once a year for bacteria, or anytime you notice a sudden change in taste, color, or smell. Uh, particularly after or around flooding events, Testing for bacteria would be really important to do. Uh, if you know the well's been inundated, you really want to stop using it. But if you suspect it's been inundated, you know, you could have a water test done to confirm that suspicion. Um, so anytime there's flooding, you know, it, it is a good idea. If you're in a flood-prone area, it might be a good idea to have a, a water test kit on hand uh, to, check that, to check that well. Um, nitrate is, is another constituent that we would recommend every well uh, be tested for annually or once a year, um, or any time uh, there might be somebody in the home who's pregnant or may become pregnant is another important time to test for nitrate. And then third, arsenic is the other thing that we'd recommend every well test for at least once. And if levels of arsenic are elevated, maybe consider testing on a more frequent basis because all these things with respect to bacteria, nitrate, or arsenic, these are all things that might might change over time. Uh, so testing more than once can often give us uh, some indication of whether or not uh, the well is stable uh, or whether those constituents are changing. And then based on the other things that we talked about, there might be other contaminants that you consider testing for based on the rock or soil that occur in your area um, or aesthetic concerns that you might be experiencing with your water. If you're considering testing, the first step and this is oftentimes a barrier, is people just don't know where to send a water sample. Um, there's information here on how to locate a certified testing lab. The Wisconsin DNR has a website that lists testing, testing labs or opportunities. Uh, find one that's convenient for you. It doesn't really matter where you send a sample. Uh, pick a lab that's convenient for you. And there's labs all over the state of Wisconsin uh, that hopefully make it easy for you to, to request a sample kit and get that kit back to the lab in a respectable amount of time. Um, I highlighted the Water Environmental Analysis Lab. That's the lab that I work with 
uh, at UW Stevens Point that has a, a partnership with, with Extension. Um, and that's where uh, we've customized a lot of the test packages to highlight a lot of the, the common problems that people might experience with their wells. Um, so if you're considering testing, locate the lab, contact that lab ahead of time, because they're going to have specialized bottles that they want you to use. And they're going to have specialized instructions to help walk you through how to collect that sample. Collecting a sample is easier than a lot of people probably think. Um, sampling instructions, uh, the vast majority of people are going to be able to follow. Uh, and I think it's much more difficult than oftentimes uh, we let on to, to, to collect uh, or to screw up a water sample. Um, with a little bit of training, I, I truly feel that anybody can collect a water sample. Uh, don't, uh, you know, don't let the instructions scare you uh, because it's probably easier than most people realize. Um, and then lastly, I just want to put up some useful websites. Um, these are websites which uh, I use to, to put together a lot of this information. Um, and instead of putting web links, I just wrote down what I would use to search for. Uh, if I were searching on some sort of uh, search engine, what are the key terms I would, would put in to access those websites? And, and that's what that language there is meant to represent. So uh, in the case of, uh, you know, if I'm looking for information on water treatment, you know, we'd type in approved water treatment devices, Department of Safety, Professional Services. Um, following those online search terms should be able to, to provide you with links to the, the information um, that we've talked about here. Um, and with that, I, I hope that provides an overview of, uh, of kind of the important responsibility that private well owners have. I hope it provides some perspective on the common uh, water quality complaints or issues people are experiencing, why they occur, um, where they occur, and then maybe a little bit of information about what people can do um, if they're experiencing those problems. Um, so I'm going to end it there. Uh, my contact info is, is listed. Feel free to reach out. Uh, via email or phone. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, it's one of the more enjoyable things I get to do is talk with citizens about their well water or groundwater. Uh, so don't hesitate to contact me if, if there's concerns or questions that you have. Thank you.